Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending our lecture tonight, presented by Gene DiOrio, a man of history. Gene is dedicated to preservation and community, and I thought I'd take a few moments to read something that was written about him in a recent article. To know Gene DiOrio is to know a man from another place and time. It is apparent in everything from his patrician speech, his scholarly demeanor, and his fine manners befitting that of a true gentleman to his vast array of interests. Gene reminds one of a handsome movie actor from the British Masterpiece Theater <laughs> or a vintage 1940s film noir. He would be the devilishly smart man, the one who sits quietly back and surveys the situation during the entire film, only to save the day by the movie's end. <laughs> At any rate, a uh, gentleman who needs no introduction, our own Eugene Dior. Jim, I think Skip and Pete are back in the other room if you want to get them. They're lost in time. What he's really trying to tell you all is how old I'm getting. I think that was really the, the thing. Well, happy to have you here for another lecture, and tonight is advertised it is going to be Scotland. Uh, a few points before I start to show you the pictures. First of all, this young man who's working with us this summer is the reason why we started this idea. Brian is uh, here from the University of Pennsylvania. He's been working beautifully this summer with us as an intern, and he's going to go into London this fall uh, at the University of London, and he can't wait to get there. And he's talked to me about traveling and talked to me about Scotland and how very much he wants to go there while he's here. So I told him I had pictures and he wanted to see them, so that led to, well, why don't we just do a program some evening here? So Ryan is uh, sort of the starting point on this whole evening. What we're going to do this evening, this is, these pictures are not recent. They were taken in 1968 uh, when I was younger and cared to travel and did more. And I took a trip to Britain. I had been in, Eng in England a few times before, but mostly London and a few areas. But I wanted to um, see some of the countryside. So I planned a trip that was largely country touring, not really um, doing cities as such. I had been to London a few times. So we then developed, I worked on a plan how I was going to do this, this touring and decided that I would go to Scotland first. And what you're going to see tonight is a lot of ship pictures because I love ships and love the sea, and I realized that I could get to Scotland by ship. The Canadian Pacific Railroad had a great division, its, its shipping division, and Canadian Pacific was still operating steamers back in 1968 between Canada and Great Britain. Now another point in going over there was to go to our sister city, Greenock. Uh, back in the Eisenhower administration, a program started for uh, sister cities, and the idea was to have a sister city between one city in the United States and a city in abroad. Exchange of people, cultural ideas, and so forth. Coastville decided to do it and chose this city of Greenock, which is on the Clyde. Now, why Greenock? Well, there were historical reasons. First of all, the known, first known landowners of what is now the city of Coatesville came from that area, the Fleming family. Uh, also in the 60s, three of us got together, Stuart Houston, uh, Jake Wagner, who was mayor at the time, and I, and created the Coatesville Historical Commission. I was interested in historic preservation. The mayor wanted some sort of an organization to look after historical events. And Stuart was very interested in this sister city. And of course, there's family reasons. Much of the family came from there. So it was done. And I found to my delight that if I went over on the Canadian Pacific, their first call was Greenock. So I could go directly to Greenock in Scotland aboard a ship. So tonight you're going to see pictures of ship, uh, the travel over there. Another feature which we'll see as we go through this is the, um, the fact that during this, come in. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Uh, another feature that you're going to see uh, of this trip was during the entire trip, both in Scotland and England, I stayed with families in private homes, and you'll be meeting these people as we go through it. So we'll start the pictures. 
Good evening. Good evening. Sam, am I where you, right here? Okay. Look at the other light and shut that door. Good. All right. Um, the trip began in Montreal. Canadian Pacific was a vast, vast transportation entity with railroads primarily, but also steamships and hotels. And to my great delight, I found I could go over there by ship on the Canadian Pacific. So this was at the uh, Montreal. I flew up to Montreal the night before, spent a night in a Canadian Pacific hotel. Then the next morning, bright and early, went down to the piers and boarded the ship. Had breakfast on board. And then I was, uh, we had time yet, so I got off and I walked around the piers. Now this is like a train disease to a ship disease. I love them both, I like to look at ships. So the piers were, were a delight there. Canadian Pacific, uh, some years ago, shed both its hotel groups and its um, ships, but the passenger ships were pretty go much gone anyway. In the years before the Second World War, Canadian Pacific had a rather large fleet of passenger ships operating on both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and they always were named Empress. Empress of Scotland, Empress of Britain, Empress of Japan, or whatever. Their fleet was pretty well decimated uh, during the Second World War. They never went back to the Pacific as far as I know, but they did continue to have ships to Britain. This was uh, one of three ships that they were operating. They were smaller ships, but very, very cozy. And we had a rather pleasant crossing. I, I loved this ship, but I had a rather amusing experience um, as I say, I went up the night before, came down to the ship that morning, checked in, went to the dining room to get breakfast, and met the dining room manager. And of course, on these things, you get assigned to a table. And um, he placed me um, at the chief purser's table, which was in the middle of the, sh of the dining room, a lovely table, nice group of people, and I thought, oh, this is gonna be lovely. So I had breakfast, and then I went off the ship to take these pictures. Here we're getting ready to sail, the tugs are moving in. I come back uh, after we sailed and we're going up the river, and it was time for lunch. I went down to the dining room, proceeded to my table, and the uh, dining room manager met me and said, oh no, Mr. Diario, we've moved you. We're not, you're not gonna be sitting there. And I thought, oh Lord, what have I done wrong? I guess I don't look good enough. Uh, he said, we're going to put you at the captain's table. And with very typical British understatement, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> well, being seated at the captain's table, of course, is an honor. In my case, it wasn't because I was dignified or anything. They just needed a, another guy to fill in a table of six. So I guess I looked decent. And of course, sometimes being at the captain's table can be a little, oh, usually the most dignified, elderly, and maybe tiresome people to go get there. I was only 36 at the time, and I thought, oh, this could be a bit boring. But one does not decline an invitation to sit at the captain's table. Uh, turned out it was marvelous. Uh, I had a very great time. Besides the captain, there was another gentleman who was a retired British general, General Burke. Related to the Burks who have the department stores and silver stores all across Canada, Three ladies, one a very dignified grand dame, Mrs. John Labatt, the widow of the founder of Labatt's Brewery and all that. She was off to see the Pope and a few other details while she was touring Europe. Her bishop had arranged that. And she had a delightful lady, a traveling companion who was with her from uh, uh, Newfoundland. Well, the third person was Lady Weir, the Viscountess Weir. So here I am saddled between two very grand dames, thinking this is going to be quite a trip. It turned out they were both lovely. Lady Weir was superb. She was Canadian born, had married Lord Weir, whose family had the Weir Manufacturing Company. And among other things, they made parts for ships. And then I later found out that Lord Weir was on the board of directors of the International Nickel Company, 
which rang a bell because, as I remember, Skip, we used to do quite a bit of uh, foreign conversion for them. Yeah. So Lady Weir was just marvelous, and um, it, it was a superb crossing. Well, we sailed um, well, late morning, early, uh, from the pier here at Montreal. Tugs had to pull us out. As you can see, we were in a sort of enclosed area. There's something about leaving a port that's always thrilling. Unlike an airplane where you get on and you're in a sealed can, I don't like flying, as you probably guessed. <laughs> but when uh, a ship starts to move and, and you're moving away from the pier bit by bit, there's a certain thrill to it that you feel like you're going into a whole other world, which really you are. Well, there's Montreal in the background as we pulled away from the pier and people watching from the back end. The tug's doing a job. Montreal, I think, is Canada's largest city, it in Toronto. And of course, it's in Quebec, so uh, names are in French. Well, everything is in French and English now. 1968, 1968. Montreal, disappearing behind us. One of my favorite shots with the flag over the, the, the uh, I think it's the Jacques Cartier Bridge over the St. Lawrence River. This was something new because the other trips to Europe I had taken the ship from New York. But because I wanted to go to Greenock and do something different, it was fun to do it from Canada. So we moved up the river. It's pretty flat country there uh, in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, nothing dramatic along the river. We had a beautiful day to sail. And occasionally we passed another ship. And I always loved it when we'd go under bridge and sort of wonder, are we going to make it? Are we going to hit? But of course we didn't. As the afternoon got on, it got sort of cloudy and foggy. Well, the next day, uh, we were in the wider part of the um, St. Lawrence. It, it becomes quite wide it's much, once it, you get past uh, Quebec. And one of the great thrills, and I had to thank Lady Weir for this, we had had dinner the first night, and we came to Quebec. We didn't anchor uh, at a pier. We just anchored in a road. But uh, she said, come on, we're gonna, you're going to see this. So I followed her. We went to an upper deck and had the great thrill of passing by Quebec at night, all lit. It, it was really beautiful. Well, here she is. This is the Empress of Canada. She was built in England uh, in 19, launched in 60. She was, I think, about 650 feet long. She did an average speed of 21 knots in the main lounge. another lounge, and the dining room. And I must say the food was superb, I loved it. And the Mayfair Lounge. I remember one evening we went there after dinner and as a special treat they were serving, can you guess it, hot dogs. <laughs> now hot dogs are usually something we smear with mustard needed a ball game. These were served with white glove waiters from silver trolleys. Only the British could do this, <laughs> but it was great fun. It was really quite lovely. Um, I love the sea and, and the different moods of it from time to time. We had a, a mixed crossing. We had some days of rain. We're still in the St. Lawrence at this point, and what you see on the horizon, there's a long, long island called Anticosti Island. And we could see it in the distance. Uh, I don't think it's terribly well inhabited, but I'm told it's a great place for sports, fishing, and all that sort of thing. And of course, the sea is fascinating in its moods and the uh, skyscapes that go with it. Well, when you come to the upper length of the St. Lawrence, you come to um, Newfoundland. And you go to the north or to the south. They preferred going to the north because it was the shorter route through what are known as the Straits of Belle Isle. 
Um, the captain told me that in about two more weeks it would probably freeze up and you couldn't go through, you'd have to take the southern route. I had hoped to really see it, but as I was warned, the weather is always bad there, and no exception it was. I was up early in the morning, we went through the Straits of Belle Isle, couldn't see a thing. These pictures show you a bit about how the ships move. Notice the flag, the two positions. The ship going from side to side as we're going up and down. The ship rode pretty well. Uh, she was pretty solid. We didn't have any real wild weather, but we did have a few uh, rough days, and I found out that you better go to the doctor and get the injection so you don't get seasick. I learned on my first trip over that I wasn't the best sailor, so anyway. But it was altogether a pleasant crossing, and as we got closer to the other side, we did have some very beautiful weather. Dramatic clouds. And one day, some birds landed on the ship, and everybody was amazed that they were so far away from land, but they were, and the captain came out to watch. We were getting closer. Now, we went uh, over the northern coast of Ireland, as I remember, to come to Scotland to go to Greenock. The clouds at sea are just so dramatic. It's a shame this is, so much of this is gone now. We have lots of cruise ships, but transatlantic passenger service is pretty much dead. Of course, the jet aircraft killed it. Sea was very blue, very clear, and very beautiful at this point. We, we saw, when we were close to Britain, close to Ireland, um, these little trawlers, and um, there was always suspicion that these weren't really fishing boats, but they were Russian spy ships, Cold War adventurers looking around, and I know uh, everybody was sort of suspicious of them. Hanging over the side to get sea pictures. This was the captain, Captain Walgut, and he blinked his eyes when I took, but he was a delightful gentleman, and it was great fun to be at his, uh, his uh, table. I didn't meet him until the second day because the first night we were up the river and he was clearing Quebec and, and he was never at the table for breakfast but usually lunch and dinner. The ship's bell. And one of the passengers who... Uh, <laughs> looked like a mushroom cloud, that one. Well, we were getting very close to our destination. Some of my fellow passengers, uh, both gentlemen were British Army officers, returning after a tour of duty in, um, in Canada. And yours truly. A little thinner. And we had a rainbow, perfectly beautiful rainbow. It was the last day out. My cabin, it was a very comfortable ship and um, all the space I needed. Uh, we'll change the reel. Now, here's a map of Scotland. I should have brought a pointer, but let me try to show you briefly what we're doing. Um, we're coming down the coast and here, which is the Clyde, and that is the island of Arran, which you're going to see a bit. And my trip was there and through the Clyde and then eventually further north, uh, a high point was to go to the Isle of Skye. And then we went to Inverness and came down the other side. Now, I spoke to the captain about wanting to see Holy Isle, which belonged to Stuart Houston. And he says, well, I'll tell you the exact time when it'll come into view as we move into the Clyde. So very kindly, he invited me up to the bridge. So there's Holy Island. Literally, the first thing I got to see in Scotland, thanks to the captain who had me on the bridge to see it. Now, Stuart Houston owned this for how many years, Skip, 10, 15 years, something like that? 
And it was an interesting thing. It's like a miniature Gibraltar. Uh, it's about two miles long and maybe a half a mile wide at its widest point. And it's quite a prominent place. Pardon? Sure-footed sheep, right, 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 right. We'll talk about it a little more. It gets its name from a medieval saint. But anyway, I saw this and the captain left me stay on the bridge. So I had the, uh, the great pleasure of, of coming up the Clyde on the bridge. Passing there is the Holy Isle in the background. The Holy Isle is like a satellite island off the island of Arran. And we'll be going to Arran a little later in the, in the talk. It's quite beautiful. Uh, the whole Clyde area, I thought, was just breathtakingly beautiful. And I was extremely fortunate to have this very, very clear day for it. The captain said usually he brings the ship in through fog and mist, but this was perfect. The shore. And of course, it's like our Chesapeake Bay. It's a, it's a boatman's paradise. Wonderful clouds. I was so, so pleased. I couldn't have had a better introduction to Scotland. Well, we were a bit early. So the captain decided to do a man over boat, overboard <coughs> boat drill. Blew the whistle. I don't know what they threw over. But um, they proceeded to turn round and round in circles. People on shore must have wondered what was happening. And they lowered some lifeboats and went through this drill. It's quite interesting. And then you could see the circle from as we were going around. <clears throat> so from my vantage point on the bridge, I got to see the lifeboats being picked back up. We've watched so many Titanic movies lately, but they were going the other direction, down. <laughs> but it was quite impressive to, to, to see the whole business of lowering these things and bringing them back. And of course, I was hanging over the, over the rail, over the side of the bridge there to get these pictures. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're large. I mean, they seat more people than you would think, you know. They're quite sizable. So I enjoyed all this, watching them uh, bring it up. Well, then we proceeded on our way uh, further up the river, up the bay. Small little towns here and there along the shore. Just breathtakingly beautiful. The captain told me that there had been times when he was sailing from Greenock with Scots who were emigrating to America, leaving their home. And he said they stared around the rail crying at the thought of leaving beautiful, beautiful Scotland. Uh, Captain Edwards and his wife, um, we chatted quite a lot. They were a delightful couple. Uh, she was a cousin or niece of the Duke of Norfolk who traditionally handles ceremonies uh, in the royal family. It was great fun. I enjoyed it all. Hi, oh, I'm a dapper. How about that? <laughs> yeah. All right. We're moving further. It's a long run, quite a long run uh, up the uh, uh, Clyde to get there. Now, during the Second World War, this was a very, very busy area as we were moving troops to Scotland to get ready for the Normandy invasion. Uh, it was much too risky to take large ships into Southampton on the south of England because of the submarines. So they took him up to this area um, uh, around Northern Ireland, which was part of the British. Ireland remained neutral during the war and there was always concern. So they would come over Northern Ireland and then come into the Clyde and, and unload troops at, at Greenock. Here we are, we're approaching, there's a captain at the bridge. Now up here uh, is a place called the Holy Lock. And this became a submarine base for the United States Navy. And for many years, we had a large fleet of submarines there, nuclear subs. Uh, I had heard about it my previous trip to Europe in 1966. Uh, I came home from England back to New York aboard the United States. The great liner that's now sitting in Philadelphia waiting for salvation or scrapping, whichever. 
And one of my uh, fellow passengers and table mates was a, an American naval officer, uh, Captain Lawrence Stoll, career Navy man in Annapolis, and he had for some time been in Scotland commanding uh, submarine tenders for the submarines. So this is the Holy Lock. Delightful chap. Um, his wife had moved over and they lived there for some time. But the Navy was transferring him back to uh, Washington to uh, work as a liaison officer between the uh, civilian secretary of the Navy and the military naval operations. So his wife had closed up their house and gone ahead of him. Now he was coming back and he said, Gene, I could have come back to the States on any naval vessel, but he decided to come back on the United States. And he said, this is the first time I've ever crossed the Atlantic with no responsibility for the ship. So he was having a ball, really having a ball. And we were at the same table and we got to be great good friends. This is General Burke, who was at the captain's table. Delightful chap. Now he, he and Mrs. Uh, Labatt teased each other. At one point he turned to her, he said, Mrs. Labatt, do you like beer? So, <laughs> but he was delightful. Well, we're approaching, uh, there's two towns, Gorok, which is sort of where the Clyde turns, and then Greenock. So there we are. This is my destination. Now, we did not go into a pier. Uh, we anchored out in the harbor because she was going on to Liverpool, so we didn't go to a pier, we just anchored in the harbor. I was just so impressed with the beauty of the countryside, uh, this area. The hills, the clouds, it, it was, I could not have had a better introduction to Scotland. Quite a bit of shipping in the area, and every now and again you'd see a submarine rising. But there's Greenock. Coatesville's sister city. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it was an industrial community like Coatesville, but also very much in very beautiful countryside. That was the welcoming committee. <laughs> well, we had to leave on a tender. Now, this is sort of amusing. Um, my first uh, host uh, who lived in the area, General Macmillan, had come out unknown to me, I, I, he, I knew he was going to pick me up at the pier, but he came out on the tender and met me aboard ship. So, uh, and uh, he's at the pier with Lady Weir's husband, Lord Weir. Well, what are you doing here? Well, I'm picking up an American from, and I'm picking up Lucy, she's come home. So they came out on the tender. The arrangement was, uh, the tender would take off the luggage, go to the pier, unload it, come back and pick up the passengers. So, Anyway, we're having lunch, and uh, I get a message over the intercom, please go to the lounge, and there was General McMillan waiting for me. And uh, so Lady Weir, in her usual grand way, said, oh, and her husband was there. She said, well, come sit down, we'll have lunch. Well, we, weren't, we, didn't have, we were starting to eat, and, but we had to leave because we were going on the first tender. So in company with the general, I was whisked through customs and immigration aboard the lounge, and we got on the tender with the baggage. <laughs> well, he had something set up that afternoon, so we didn't want to da uh, dawdle. And I'll show you in a few minutes where we went. So I got off with the general, and he didn't get to eat lunch, so Lady Weir scooped up some of the turkey that was on my plate, and she made him a sandwich. He put it in his pocket. I mean, talk about British casual. <laughs> They're not as formal as you think. So we got on the tender and the general pulled the sandwich out of his pocket and laughed about how he was finishing my lunch. But it was fun to be on the tender, to be alongside of the ship. Well, here she is, the Empress of Canada, really a very handsome ship. And as we pulled away, I took a series of pictures. I especially like that one, the full side view. Very graceful, good lines. So just the general and I and all the luggage crossing the water to the pier. Part of the shipyard, um, Greenock was home to a company named Scott's, one of the oldest shipyards in Britain. And there you see the derricks and the piers right along the, the river. Far away, magnificent cloud effects that day. So here we are on the pier, and you see some of the shipyards in the distance. 
Now, as I told you earlier, I stayed with families, and the first family was General Macmillan. And this was his tidy little house <laughs> called Finliston, Finlistone. And overlooked the Clyde. They had something like a thousand acre estate, as I remember. Uh, he had had quite a distinguished career in the army in India, or well, India, I think, as they called it in the Raj. And at one time had been head of the army in Scotland, had commanded Stirling Castle. And one of his last achievements before he retired, he was governor general of Gibraltar. But this was my home <laughs> where I stayed with the Macmillans. Uh, yeah, the first drop, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful vistas of the Clyde from their estate. Just breathtaking. So here they are, uh, General, General, uh, General Sir Gordon. He had been knighted, so he was General Sir Gordon Macmillan of Macmillan because he was also the head of the Macmillan clan. Very distinguished gentleman. Uh, Lady Macmillan was um, from an old Scottish family, and she was a gardener. Not just a gardener, she was, operated a greenhouse operation from uh, the estate. She did weddings and programs, and she was very knowledgeable. And I remember the very first night I had dinner there. She said, now Eugene, you come from Pennsylvania. Have you ever seen a place, you know, a place called Longwood Gardens? <laughs> Well, it turned out that she always had students who worked at her greenhouse, and some of them stayed in the house. And they had had a young man uh, who had won one of Longwood's uh, internships, and he was there uh, at, uh, for, I think, a period of a couple years. So they told, him all, told me all about him, and I said, yes, I'd promised to look him up when I got back, which I did. Turned out to be a delightful boy. This was one of the students who was uh, there all the time, the general with Brandy. He was absolutely delightful. Um, in the evenings after dinner, he, uh, he and I would get together and he'd bring a tray and we'd have brandy and he would show me pictures of his career. He was just a marvelous person. Well now, with my passion for ships and great interest in Kennard, uh, the QE2 was under construction at John Brown's shipyard. In indicating where I wanted to go when I was there, I said, well, if possible, could we drive by uh, John Brown's yard and maybe I get a look at the ship? Well, it turned out General Macmillan himself was in the shipyard business, not with John Brown's, but he knew everybody up and down the river. So he arranged uh, with the management there and drove me up and I had a thrill. I had a top to bottom tour of the QE2 while she was being built. John Brown's um, happily uh, had a fabulous reputation. Unhappily, it's pretty much gone now, but for years this was one of Europe's greatest shipyards, and the Kennard Steamship Company usually went to them. The Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth, the Aquitania, a long list of famous ships were buried, uh, uh, born in this yard. This was the last of these, and to actually see it and go through it, it had been launched the previous year, and now it was in the fitting out basin. <clears throat> this is the Clyde River that you can see. That was another ship under construction there. Oops. Something didn't go down, sorry. There we are. As they say in Britain, give it a good bash and it'll be all right. This was a um, artist's sketch of what the ship was gonna look like uh, when it was finished. Of course, she had a very distinguished career. She came out in 69 and just only two or three years ago, it was finally retired. It's now in, uh, I think, Dubai supposed to be converted into a hotel or something. Um, John Brown built the two famous Kennard Queens, the Queen Elizabeth, which you see there, and then also the incomparable, ineffable Queen Mary, my favorite ship. She's the only one of that great period that survived. She's now a tourist attraction in Long Beach, California, but she was built there in, in John Brown's. 
Well, we walked all over the ship, had marvelous time. It's supposed to focus automatically, it doesn't always do it, but anyway. And from the upper decks had this great view uh, of the town. Very sad, this is out of business now, and most of these yards, I think, are gone. Sort of like some of our steel plants. Now, here you see the Clyde, and in back of it, you see a small river called the Cart. Now, the Clyde is not that wide at this point, and when they build a major ship, like the Queens, uh, the adjoining shot, uh, section there was where they were built, because it had to be built with a dead shot back to the Cart. The river wasn't that wide, the Cart was deeply dredged, and they had to have tugs and chains when a big ship was launched, and this was the only part where they could do something that large. When the Queen Mary was finally finished in 36, I think it was, uh, they had some real scares, I was told. It actually went aground for a few minutes in this very tight water. This gentleman was representative of the uh, company and he was touring, uh, he was tour guide with the general. And one of my favorite pictures on board the QE2. <laughs> I had gotten a preliminary deck plan from the office in New York and um, the general was amazed when I pulled it out and I had a deck plan with me. <laughs> but there we are, that's four years later, I, I crossed on the QE2 uh, from New York to uh, England. Vast, vast yard. Now Ryan's mother tells me that she made a crossing on this, so I was particularly anxious to include a number of pictures for her uh, to see what the ship was like. This was looking through one of the cabins. After the tour, we went back to the office and I had the pleasure of meeting Sir John Ranney, who was uh, general manager of the yard. And we had tea and, and scone and biscuits. And he told me some of the, the, the problems. Of course, building something like this, you bring any number of suppliers into it. And he said the whole trick was to coordinate it so that the materials and the products, whatever it were, arrived in the order in which you needed. And in his rather thick Scottish bird, he says, yeah, sometimes he says, you know, the mattresses, the, the, the mattresses arrived, but the beds have not arrived yet. So what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> but this was fascinating, absolutely fascinating to go through this. I was thrilled to get these pictures. And, and they told me, this one, I, I figured I'd never get that close to the prow again. <laughs> but she was very tight up against the, the, uh, the dock, the uh, fitting out dock. And uh, she was not named for the Queen, I'm told, so it would have been Queen Elizabeth II with Roman numerals, but she was named for the first Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth. <coughs> Single stack, and initially they didn't paint it in the canard red colors, which brought a lot of criticism, but eventually the company did uh, give in to criticism and did paint it in the canard colors. <coughs> So this was a very great highlight of the trip for me uh, to see this and to get here at John Brown's. Well, later in the trip, I took a trip down the Clyde and the general took me to the pier at Gurak, where uh, I went down to go to the island of Aaron. Not quite so clear as the day we arrived and there's passing the Holy Lock, it was sort of cloudy. A number of small towns, uh, the steamer did sort of the rounds down the river and one of the towns was Dunoon, I think this was, where we stopped. Small castle there, interesting pier at Dunoon. I think the company was called the Great Caledonian Steamship Company, or Steam Packet Company, that operated these steamers on the, uh, the Clyde. Although it was a bit cloudy, it was a pleasant trip, and I did enjoy the run down the river. Also at the pier was this old sidewheeler. These are pretty much gone, disappearing, but at one time, sidewheelers were very common throughout rivers and lakes in Europe. And I watched as this uh, sailed off and the paddle wheels were turning. A very dramatic sight, the age of steam. 
Um, we stopped at, I think, two or three places. I think this was called uh, Largs uh, on our way down to Aaron. It was just a wonderful. Of course, in the old days, there used to be boats like this up and down the Chesapeake before all the bridges, and people would uh, get to points by boat. This was another stop called Fairly, uh, just a small little place. Typical scenery in this area. There I am, enjoying it all. Well, we came into a port on the northern portion of Arran called Locranza. Very typical Scottish scenery. Uh, Arran has been described sometimes as Scotland in miniature in that the upper part of it is hilly, sort of semi-mountainous, rough countryside, and the southern part is more farmland, much more open. But we came in through this opening to Locranza. As you can see, we're arriving. And there's a ruined castle there, which you can see at the peak. Scotland's history is full of wars and fights, and so there's lots of ruined castles all over the place. But it's rather picturesque, and we came into La Cranza and anchored, and that's where I got off the boat. And there's the ship. Now, this ship is the Queen Mary II, and there's a couple of good stories. I'll tell you only one now, but when the Queen Mary was finally uh, launched as the Queen Mary, or be even before the launching, the company had decided to call it Queen Mary. And uh, they went to register the name with the British Board of Shipping, and to Cunard's board's horror, they found that there was already another ship of British registry with the name Queen Mary. And here they were all set to have Queen Mary herself come up to Clyde Bank to christen it. So it was a good bit of uh, embarrassed maneuvering and uh, they approached the company here and they said, well, of course, they'd be willing to change it. Well, they weren't. The Scots said, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to change it for you. You know, we love our ship, we love our queen, and it's a new one, we like it, and Great Canal will just have to find something else. Well, they compromised, finally. They kept the name Queen Mary, but called it Queen Mary II. And I knew this story, and I was delighted that this was the ship that I was going to get that day. And I remember in the lounge, there was an oil painting of Queen Mary and under it a plaque that was said, presented by the Kennard Steamship Company. So they got around it. Well, Stuart Houston had a, uh, a representative over here um, who looked after his properties. His name was Laird and he had contacted him in, in advance of my going. Well, the day I went over to Aaron, Major Laird was involved with a, um, here he is, with a um, sea bass, some sort of a fishing uh, affair. And delightful chap, but he wasn't able to do touring with me because uh, he was involved with this, this sea festival. But there he is with uh, Mrs. Laird. He was a retired major from the British Army and he was Stuart's land representative over there. So they had this great sea uh, festival, which I watched for a while. Uh, this was near Brodick. I had taken a bus from La Cranza on the north of the part of the island down to Brodick, which is sort of the middle of, of Aaron. And I watched this for a while, and there is the ghillie shooting off the gun to tell them it's starting, it's starting. Well, the major architectural thing to see over there is Brodick uh, Castle. Great medieval, added to in the Victorian times, and uh, the Earls of Arran, the Dukes of Hamilton had it. But like so many of those places, you know, they couldn't keep it up and it went to the National Trust in lieu of taxes and death duties. But it was beautifully maintained. Gardens were lovely. And I hiked all around the place. I really was impressed with it. Brodick. I'm sorry, some of these slides have slipped. I purchased them. But this was the interior. And um, what impressed me was the place looked like it could just move in, take down the ropes. It wasn't overly done with guardrails or formality. This was the dining room of the house. These are slides I purchased, and I just realized tonight when I reran these, they seem to be slipping a bit. 
and one of the bedrooms was beautifully maintained, beautifully maintained. Brodick. Now, <clears throat> since Major Laird couldn't do the touring with me himself, he arranged for a driver. So for quite a while, I drove around the island with this driver. And of course, I wanted to get a better look at Holy Isle. And there it is, we're approaching the thing. Um, there is a bay, which you'll see later, called Lamlash, and I understand that this was called Lamlash until somewhere around 1830 when it officially became the Holy Island. The Holy comes from the fact that at one time in, oh, I think the seventh or eighth century, there was a monk, a saint, Saint Molaise, who uh, lived there in a cave, Saint Molay, and at one time it was called Molay, and uh, thus the name Holy Isle. I'm told that in recent years there's been a colony of Buddhists yeah. who have settled in this area. So there it is, and uh, in the distance, as I say, it's a great rock pile, like a miniature Gibraltar. After I came back from this trip, I showed these pictures, and Mrs. Houston said, well, now, Eugene, now you understand why I didn't want to go live there. <laughs> there was a lighthouse and a lighthouse keeper's cottage, and I think just one other building. There was a golf course there at, uh, in the area, which, we, uh, which you just saw. It was very dramatic, but I think Uncle Stewart just adored having a, a hunk of Scotland. Uh, it was a little area called King's Cross on the mainland of Arran, which Mr. Houston owned some property there too. A deep channel uh, between the main island and the Holy Island. Further on in the trip, when I was in England, uh, one of the families I stayed with, the husband was an admiral, retired admiral, and he said, I told him about this, and he said, oh yes, he said, it's deep enough, I once took an aircraft carrier through there. So it is a very deep channel. I didn't get on the island itself. That would have taken another day and rowboats and a whole bit. And I was just as happy to not, not go over there. But it was impressive. As I say, much of the southern part uh, is more farmland, not as rugged as the northern part of Arran. Well, there is also Lamlash Bay and a little town of Lamlash. Um, which I thought was spectacularly beautiful. My driver, um, we had, had me there, and we stopped a while, and I said, oh, what a gorgeous spot, how restful. What a wonderful place to have a cottage for a couple of months in the summer with a case of scotch and a case of books. And he said very quietly, he said, well, I don't know about the books. <laughs> <laughs> Dour little Scotsman. Uh, but Brodick, the town itself, was just beautiful. And of course, the mountain that's here is called Goat Fell. After the last of the Hamiltons and the other families that you know, couldn't keep these up, it all went to the National Trust uh, of Scotland, and it's been preserved as, as open. But Brodick was delightful. I enjoyed hiking around. Some of these old houses look like Pennsylvania Railroad stations of the 1880s, but same architecture. It was, Aaron is quite a vacation spot, and I think becoming so more and more all the time. I hated to leave it. I, I was really enthralled with it. Well, I got back to where the fishing festival was coming to a close, and they were weighing the catch. And when I left uh, back on the boat, I didn't go all the way back up to uh, Gurok. Uh, I just went a crossing to um, Fairley, where General Macmillan had come down and was waiting for me. Well, lots of castles to visit, and one that I went to see with the Macmillans was um, Culain. This is a rather dramatic affair. It sits right on a rocky coast. Built in the 17th, 18th century, and it's what I call um, sort of classical Castle Gothic, uh, but yet formal. Uh, the outside looks medieval, but inside a lot of very formal rooms. And it just is over the sea. The ca this was the Kennedy clan who had this place. 
Uh, after the Second World War, the Scots uh, reserved an apartment in this castle for General Eisenhower that he could use. Oh, I'm sorry, there's another one that slipped. Never mind. Well, the, the gardens were especially present. Now, Mrs. Uh, Lady uh, Macmillan was on the National Trust for Gardens. And to my great amazement, she hiked me through this, and I was amazed to see palm trees, which you can see on the right of the picture. Kept warm because of the Gulf Stream. And of course, the Scots castles are loaded with guns and swords and rather bloody history. <laughs> but the inside of the castle is done in pretty much very formal Adams style, French style furniture. I'm sorry, these seem to be slipping. These are slides I purchased. The dining room. Well, one of the great features of the house is this stair hall. Adam, very classical. Beautifully done, elliptical. One of the loveliest of its kind I saw anywhere over there. I thought it was just beautiful. Stair hall. Another view of it. Well, back to uh, Greenock. Uh, General McMillan had been a founder and, a, and a, uh, one of the backers of a, a um, graving dock that was built and connected with the Scotch Yard. So of course he took me to see it with my interest in ships. And he showed me this little corner. At one time, the first Queen Elizabeth was brought in here for some repairs and it was just a few feet too long. So they had to notch out this space to fit it in. Well, you know, the Queen Elizabeth, uh, not the QE2, but the first one was built at John Brown's, was not finished when the war came on. And so um, the British, Navy was anxious to get it out of there because they needed the yard for military ships. So um, she was finished and she made a maiden voyage to New York under close secrecy. Fortunately, everything worked, no breakdowns. And she came to New York in dead secret in 1940. This was quite a busy spot. And here's the general. He was just wonderful. Lots of wonderful stories. As I told you, he would show me pictures after dinner. In his capacity as Governor General of Gibraltar, it fell to him to entertain the Queen. Uh, after her coronation, she made a grand tour of the, of the empire, of all the British Commonwealth. And when I'm told that when you go to Gibraltar, one of the sights to see is a colony of monkeys, which are on the upper level. And it, the story is, as long as the colony survives, Britain will hold on to Gibraltar. Churchill during the war said, make sure they're well fed. Make sure they're well fed. Keep them. Well, he had the picture uh, when the queen was there. She was taken to this upper level where they are and uh, with Prince Philip. And there was a whole gaggle of reporters there um, covering the thing. They were all sitting on an embankment. And of course, uh, it's traditional that visitors are given peanuts or something to throw to them. Well, Prince Philip had an ornery moment. Instead of throwing the peanuts to the apes, he threw them to the reporters. <laughs> what I loved was the queen's face. She looked as if, wait till I get you home. <laughs> the queen's face, she was, oh yeah. Well, we went through Scotch Yard, which as I say, is one of the oldest of the uh, shipyards, and I understand this is all gone. They just went out of business, it's all been cleared. So, well, one of the things we did was to call upon the mayor, or the provost, as they call him in Britain, of Greenock. And General Macmillan had arranged this. This was the provost, I think his name was William Riddle, wearing his chain of office. Ingrid, don't you think we should have something like that in Coastville for the mayor? <laughs> And uh, it was very gracious, and I went there and took some pictures, and then, of course, had to sign the official guest register. Uh, one thing they had in his uh, office was a large picture taken during the war of an enormous fire. And I said, well, did they hit a lot of buildings? He said, no, they hit a distillery, and all these barrels of whiskey burned, and the f rolling down the hillside blazing. <laughs> There's the seal. In fact, we have something like that hanging in Coastal City Hall. It's the Godspeed Green Ark. Well, um, it was time after the visit there to move on north to my second family. 
So it was arranged that we would meet at Loch Lomond. Foggy, misty day, and the general drove me up to Loch Lomond, where we met my next host. Now this picture, so after I came back, I showed these pictures to some Scottish friends, and one who said, Gene, that's the most perfect picture of Scotland. The grass, the trees, the little white college, and the mist. It made, made her homesick. It was, it was so real. I purchased a few slides. I didn't get to see Loch Lomond in its glory. It was, it was pretty foggy the whole time I was there. I was rather fortunate on this trip, though. I mean, it was in September. You never know what you're going to get with weather. Well, my next host, uh, Colonel Sandalum, we then drove, and we went to Inverara, a little further north. It was the town of Inverara. And of course, the big thing there is to see Inverara Castle. This is the seat of the Dukes of Argyle. And like uh, others, it uh, looks like a medieval castle, but it was only built in the 18th century with very handsome interior rooms. And of course, with a collection of armor, pikes, swords. These are not the most peaceable people in the world, believe me. But the interior, very formal, uh, Adams-style classical furniture and fittings. And, and great chandeliers, beautiful, it was very impressive. And of course, I had to have my picture taken there. Two of them, in fact. <laughs> Looking like I just bought the place. <laughs> Well, we moved on north. Uh, I don't remember all the valleys and all the names, but so many ruined castles and so forth. Um, Luck, I forget what this was called. Changing mists and clouds. And you take your raincoat when you go to Scotland, believe me. Oh, I'm sorry, another one is... So well, this was my second host. Uh, Colonel Sandal and his wife had a 3,000 acre sheep farm in the midst of nowhere. <laughs> Talk about quiet. But it was, it was just beautiful. And uh, I stayed with them. This was the view from the front of their house over the grounds. And the family, his wife and children uh, and their dog. Now, I have to tell you, if you don't like dogs, you should never agree to be a house guest in a British home because they really love it. But they were a lovely couple. He was retired from the Army. Uh, the children were delightful, May, and I think the boy was Andrew. I took this at dinner with him looking at a candle. Delightful children. And their home uh, was very pleasant. And there it is, nestled away in the countryside. Well, the uh, organization in London that I dealt with that cooked out, arranged all this, uh, they didn't have anyone available in the north. But Colonel Sandlin agreed to um, drive, so I spent a few days with him. We went to Oban, um, which wasn't too far from where they were an interesting port. And this great uh, structure, it's a round uh, wall. It's not a ruin. It was built by some millionaire who just wanted this thing built. And it's a circular uh, building with these Gothic arches. And it's uh, the thing that catches your eye in the hillside in Oban. Uh, Castle Stalker, I think that's called. Yes. Well, we moved on north, more lakes, more fjords, and um, got to um, the area of um, oh, Ben Nevis, which I think is the highest peak in Britain. Fort William, I think, is the area there. Very picturesque, very picturesque. Come on. 
And we had to go to Glencoe, and I have a few purchase slides. Now, Glencoe is dramatic scenery, and some of the gloomiest, oops, some of the gloomiest scenery I've seen in Scotland. Made gloomy by its very gloomy history. Now, after um, King James II was overthrown, Parliament gave the crown to William and Mary. And the clan chieftains were supposed to swear allegiance to, the, uh, to King William. Well, the MacDonalds, uh, who were in this area, delayed. And Lord Stair, uh, who was the high sheriff or whatever of Scotland, got very impatient with him. So uh, he moved troops into them and uh, pretended they were very, very friendly. And uh, for a number of days, and then at the right moment, they arose and massacred the McDonald's. Men, women, children, burnt their houses, the whole bit. So the place has this gloomy, gloomy history of this famous massacre. Lord Stair was completely unrepentant. He said, no, that, I got rid of that lousy crowd. Good riddance. I'm only sorry some of them got away. <laughs> well, we went there, and um, it was not a bright day like this. There you are. It was uh, that, foggy and cloudy. We drove through it two or three times. My host said, Jean, or Eugene, as they call me, he said, you got a perfect day for it. You don't want to go through this place on a bright sunny day. You get the feel when it's gloomy and foggy and misty. He said, you got a perfect day to tour this place. So we did. Glencoe. And it is gloomy. But I wanted to see it because it's so famous and it is a major spot in Scotland to tour. Well, we moved on further north. Uh, I wanted to go to the Isle of Skye. And now, until fairly recently, uh, you could only get the Skye by boat. But they built a bridge about 15 years ago. But in those days, you had to go by boat. And the easiest was on the northern part of, of uh, the northern approach to what's known as the Kyles of Lokalsh. So Colonel Sandel and I said, well, why don't we, uh, we were afraid we'd get into awful bad weather. So we made reservations and we stayed at, overnight at this delightful hotel. So that if the weather was bad, we wouldn't uh, go, but the weather was good and we did go to Sky. There was a regular ferry service here, which operated uh, from Lokash to a place called Kai Leakin. Uh, just a short run, and now there's a bridge across it. Well, Sky is, oh, the romantic area. One of the favorite British songs is uh, the Sky Boat song, which goes back to the days of Bunny Prince Charlie when he was trying to regain the throne or get the throne and uh, was wiped out at the um, Culloden. So Flora MacDonald managed to get him on a boat and get him across the sky and hit him. So thus the Sky Boat song. And I still feel you should go to Sky by boat. Of course, she went to the Tower of London for it, but never mind. Uh, the scenery in Sky was quite dramatic. Um, some of it rather bleak. I thought I was in Wyoming or someplace. But other places, beautiful fields. Now, there is a range of mountains on one end of, of um, Sky known as the Coolins, and they are mountains. None of them higher than, I think, 3,000 feet or so, but they're very rugged, very dangerous, and I'm told that people who are planning to climb the Himalayas would practice there. But we drove for quite some time around the island. It has roads. You could almost do a circle on the island. And here and there, a little cottage. Another view of the Coolins. and the fields and the inlets of water here and there. Some lonely little cottages, 
but farm country and also some very dramatic mountain scenery. I was thrilled that uh, we could drive around and see so much of the countryside and sky. Well, a major objective and the most famous landmark on sky is Dunvegan Castle. This is the seat of the McLeod family, who were very powerful in the clans. And as it happened, my driver, uh, Colonel Sandlin, uh, knew some of the families, so he contacted them, and we were able to get a private tour of the house. Went through the place. Clan McLeod, and of course, it's filled with memorabilia, animal heads, the whole bit, and portraits of the previous um, lords of it. The title, uh, when the clans ruled all this, they were some of them referred to as the Lords of the Isle. I think that title now is restricted to the heir to the throne, the Prince of Wales, who among his many titles has the Lord of the Isles. Any number of swords, knives, charming people. And the Dunvegan Cup, a great um, monumental affair and some of the previous lords in their Scottish clothing. And this portrait is Dame Flora MacLeod, who had the distinction of being the head of the clan. Women, I understand, usually didn't um, become heads of clan, but she did. And she was quite a famous figure in Scotland for many, many years. Dame Flora MacLeod, she was still living, and I had the great pleasure and honor of meeting her. She was most gracious and uh, it was just a thrill to meet this historic figure in Scotland. So there we are. Yeah. And this was her library and she had insisted on my taking this picture of her in front of this painting, which she liked. I thought it was sort of odd. It looked to me like a gay party in the West Village. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I took the picture. But the house was full of all sorts of memorabilia. Uh, the fairy flag, which dates, I was told, it's a thousand years old. And the uh, McLeod family treasured this. It's supposed to have three times in the history of their family where it will be, uh, it will save them. And one occasion occurred, I think, in the 1930s when the place caught fire and they moved the flag out and the fire went out. I don't know what the third chance will be. Beneath it is Rory Moore's horn, which was another early drinking vessel, uh, but the famous fairy flag, and there's the Moray. Yeah. But I was thrilled to see this. It is the number one attraction and of course today, I'm sure there's more and more tourists go there all the time. Um, while I was there, I met a couple of distinguished individuals who were visiting at the same time. One was a former Lord Mayor of London who sort of played tour guide through part of the house. The other one was a McLeod uh, residence. Now, of course, it has a dungeon. I mean, you had a dungeon to put people who misbehave in all these old castles. And there it is. Nice place to spend a night. Um, I, I walked all around, it, I mean, it, it sits on this promontory, it's a very dramatic location. Uh, the other distinguished person was a um, family member, his name was Ian MacLeod, who was a conservative member of parliament. And sometime after I was there, I, I learned that he had been elected uh, um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is sort of comparable to being Secretary of the Treasury in, in America. And he was uh, being considered, I'm told, for prime minister, but then he died, so I was disappointed. I was hoping that, you know, I might write a letter and get a private tour of 10 Downing Street if he got elected, but he didn't. He died. I never hesitated to make contacts. But this is on the western side of Skye, and as you can see, now that was the Seagate. You could come in through this area up to the castle through that. Dunvegan, 
I love this picture. It's so Scotland. The little humble house, the ponds, the mountains, it's, it just captures the whole thing. I've thought several times of having an enlargement made of this, except I have no more room for pictures at home. There, there I am at Dunvegan. Well, we drove about um, the island and um, the sheep, like crazy there. And a couple of times we had to wait until they crossed the road. Some dramatic clouds, houses here and there. And we went to the town of Portree. Portree is on the eastern side of the island, sort of the county seat, uh, the main center. Charming, charming community. Portree. Well, eventually uh, back to Lacoche, and there's the last look at the Coolins. I think the ferries are still operating from what I've heard, but not to the degree that they were. And of course, the town of Kotalikin was very upset when the bridge was built because that eliminated a lot of business. Another ruined castle. Well, we now went to see Island Donan castle. Now, Loch Deutsch, this I think is the most photographed building in Scotland. You see it on every travel brochure because of its very dramatic location where two or three locks come together. It dates back to medieval times, but of course it was destroyed during various wars and invasions. But sometime in the last century, I guess the 19th century, it was beautifully restored, it's still a residence, and open to the public. So we hiked across the bridge and went to see Island Donan. Very dramatic, gorgeous views. Somewhat cloudy day. You're grateful in Scotland when it doesn't rain. But I love this picture. I mean, this is so Scotland. The mist, the lonely boat. Yes, I think just about every tourist brochure has this. It is highly photogenic. It wasn't the grandest castle. We went up on the hill to uh, get a better view of the whole thing. And I was disappointed when I got away from it. I found that some very modern housing development was encroaching. But hopefully this would be protected. <coughs> well, and then uh, going further north, uh, of course, I had to see Loch Ness. And this is called Castle Urquhart, which is on the western bank of Loch Ness. Now there's this great cleft or groove through the middle of Scotland. And that's where Loch Ness is. Uh, it's famous for being very cold and very deep, seven and 800 feet. In some places I understand as much as 900 feet deep. A lot of legends and no, we didn't see the monster. Uh, we didn't see Nessie, but we did see the station where they were monitoring. It would be a great thrill if it appeared. Imagine what that would do with the tourist business. It'd be just fantastic. Well, to get to the other side, we had to go to the far northern part of Loch Ness to Inverness town, and then cross over to come down to the eastern side. Went to a town called Grant Town, um, which you see in the distance is a purchase slide. And uh, Grant Town was a charming community. And I'm still with Colonel Sandalum. Um, and we stayed at a um, charming hotel. This uh, stream, I think it's called the Spey, is famous for trout, considered one of the best in fishing in, in Scotland. Some terrific mountain territory here. So we. Um, I was impressed. I mean, I was on what was, I looked on the map, it showed a major highway, which I was expecting a four lane expressway, and it was this two lane road. That's all there was. 
Uh, I suppose they've enlarged it, but it was so beautiful. But this was a major highway, according to the maps. Uh, this is, I think, the D. And in this area is Balmoral, which is the Queen's country resort. If you saw the recent movie, The Queen, much of it uh, features this. Built by Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, and this became her winter retreat, or sorry, her fall retreat. Uh, built like a Scottish castle, but really only dates to the 19th century. And both Elizabeth and uh, Victoria loved the place and go there in the fall. No, we didn't stay. She wasn't there that day. So you can see there's no flag on the pole. That meant she wasn't in, so we didn't bother. Anyway, but it, these are purchase slides of Balmoral. And nearby, um, this little castle called Braemar, uh, the Earls of Mar, odd little building, medieval. And of course, we toured it. How do you like those staircase? But they had a comfortable dining room. Heating those places, I'm sure, was great fun. But we did Braemar, another spot to keep misbehaving people, a dungeon. The Earls of Mar. No, that's not him. Uh, but in this area, they have this great uh, festival with all these activities and pipe bands and sports and so forth. I didn't see it. It was just a purchase slide. The countryside, uh, some of this is called the Cairngorm Mountains. Some of it is quite beautiful. There's streams. You're impressed with how few people there are in some of these places. Well, we came down this road, and this is a rather spectacular road with very sharp turns. And one of these turns is called the Devil's Elbow because it's such a difficult turn. I don't know how a large bus would get it, but we came and I got out and photographed uh, this, this, uh, this turn called the Devil's Elbow. That's my driver, Colonel Sandlin. I spent several days with him. He was an excellent driver. I spent many years in the British Army. So there I am. <laughs> Couldn't resist getting that. <laughs> ah, yes, the other view. Incredibly beautiful countryside, even with fogs and mists. Well, <clears throat> we finally reached a point where we transferred to my third host. And with him, I toured Glom's castle. Uh, this is quite a stone pile. And it is the traditional spot where Macbeth murdered Duncan in Shakespeare, but that's not really true. It didn't happen here at all. But there's been enough of bloody history. There was one lady of Glom's who uh, was considered a witch, and they burned her at the stake. This, all this wonderful medieval history. Some of it's better than novels. But we toured Glom's. Now, this was the Beau Lyons family, uh, the family of Queen Elizabeth's mother, the, the Queen Mother Elizabeth, who grew up here. This was her family home. And again, full of all sorts of paintings and so forth. A vast, great big place. Um, Princess Elizabeth, uh, Princess Margaret, Elizabeth, the Queen's uh, sister, was born here. Uh, they don't quite tell you whether it was in this bed or not. I think they're afraid the tourists will start snipping souvenirs. But uh, probably she was born in this room. Well, this day it got very gloomy <coughs> as we toured the gardens there. So my third uh, host had this delightful little castle called Tullybol. Lord Moncrief, which is an old Scottish name, Moncrief, and he had the uh, distinction, his title was the uh, Baron of Nova Scotia. So this was where I stayed when I was with my third family. Turrets and towers, winding staircases, 
Tully Bowl. He had beautifully restored it. And there's the family, Lord Moncrief, his wife, and they had the son, uh, Roderick. And they had this enormous big fireplace in their living room. And there's Roderick. A little stiff at first, but he warmed up to me while I was there. Delightful boy. It was so much fun staying with families and, you know, and being, as opposed to just being in a hotel. Uh, while I was there, one day we went over to look at St. Andrews, the golf course, and it poured rain. Uh, not being a golfer, I wasn't about to catch pneumonia for the sake of saying that I walked across. So we retreated to this and sat by the fire and spent the rest of the afternoon drinking. I was drinking Trambouille, I believe. <laughs> There we are at Tully Bowl. Roderick was really a sweet kid. And of course, being the son of a baron, his title was the Honorable, the Honorable Roderick. I was very grateful to uh, Lady Weir on the way over in the ship who gave me a crash course on British titledom. It can get very, very confusing. Out through a window. I mean, it was sort of a spooky place in a way, but it was great. That was the last morning I was there and he came to see me off. He wasn't quite awake yet. Well, it was with Lord Moncrief that I toured Edinburgh. Uh, came down on this bridge. The water here is the Firth of Forth. What I was really interested in seeing was this railroad bridge, 19th century, the Firth of Forth Bridge. Great cantilever arch, and one of the most dramatic pieces of engineering I saw anywhere in Britain. Very high, as you can see, still very much in use the Firth of Forth Bridge. And there it is. Well, it rained the whole time I was touring in Edinburgh. We didn't have a clear day at all. But um, I saw a great deal of it and purchased slides. The main thing to me, uh, the most memorable, was to see the castle, which sits up on this very dramatic hillside with its walls and turrets. And of course they have great ceremonies there, uh, which I didn't get to see. I did see a changing of the guard, but it, it's quite a show place. And to me, it's the number one thing to see of all that I saw in Edinburgh. Great fortress. And uh, there's a, um, Oh, there's a chapel, and there's this huge gun that they call, I think it was called uh, Meg or something like this. Mon Meg, I think. There's also a spectacular war memorial on the grounds of it uh, with monuments to the various regiments. This was especially impressive, this uh, green, I think it was marble, built on top of a, an outjutting piece of rock. And in that steel cabinet was kept the names of all the, the uh, soldiers who died uh, for Scotland. It was really very dramatic, very impressive war memorial. Also in the castle, they keep the regalia, the crown, the swords, the scepter of Scotland. And there's the crown. And following her coronation in London, when she was crowned queen of Scotland, Elizabeth was crowned with that, the royal crown. This is all kept there, just as in London. You go to the Tower of London, you see the British royal regalia. Quite dramatic, quite dramatic. Um, oops. Another major thing is St. Giles Cathedral. This is the High Kirk or the High Church uh, in Edinburgh. St. Giles was a French saint. So why in Scotland? Well, it's because Scotland and France were very much allied against England. Grand early Gothic church. 
Some spectacular stained glass windows. And um, a wealth of Gothic carving. And I believe the queen was crowned here, I think, um, when it, after her coronation in, in uh, Britain, in England. Uh, the chapel of the uh, thistle, I think the order of the thistle is the highest rank of the various noble rankings, uh, like the garter in England. Uh, the carving here is just spectacular, the stalls of the, the various knights. with their symbols, lions and unicorns and so forth. Incredible vaulting. Well, what I thought was the third great site was the Palace of Holyrood. The Holywood ho Holyrood Houses is sometimes called. Uh, there was an early monastery there which is in ruins, but the palace uh, became the royal palace and it was um, used for some generations. Then it was allowed to fall into decay. But later on, I think it was Charles II, one of the, one of the or George III, one of the uh, British monarchs, revitalized it and restored it. So it is today the royal residence uh, when the queen comes to Edinburgh. And you see the lions and the unicorns at the gate The interior has some very grand uh, fittings and fixtures. Uh, the queen uses this room for investitures and knights and so forth, this great room. A great lounge. Nice place for small dinner parties, this grand formal dining room. But it's very much in use and when the queen comes to Edinburgh, it's her residence. Some older rooms which are fascinating uh, that are connected with earlier times. And perhaps the most famous room in the house, this bedroom, which was used by Mary, Queen of Scots. Well, after that, um, I went to my fourth family who lived in the, uh, I think it's called the Selkirks. Now this is south of Edinburgh in what's known as the Scots country. And my host here was another British uh, retired officer, Colonel Stewart, with his horses. And uh, charming farm and lovely. Uh, he too had spent much of his life in India and uh, retired to raise animals and horses on this farm. Charming place. He had with him uh, this wonderful old upright piano that he had in India and he had it shipped back. He was an opera lover and so in the evening after dinner he and I would try the piano and play opera. <laughs> it's great fun. Uh, there he is with his wife, uh, the Lady Daphne Stewart. Now as I said, Lady Weir had filled me in on this title. Now he uh, was not a nobleman, he didn't have a title but his wife did. She was the daughter of a Marquis. And uh, if you've all been watching Downton Abbey, and I think half the world has been, you know that uh, Lord Grantham is an Earl, so his daughters have the title of Lady Mary and Lady whatever. This lady, uh, her father had been a Marquis, the Marquis of Tweedale. And they took me to see uh, their ancestral home, this great place called Yester House. Poured rain that day, so I didn't take pictures, but Yester House was quite a monumental place. Uh, her father had died and her brother had succeeded to the title, so the mother was now the dowager. And in um, Downton Abbey, you have Maggie Smith playing the dowager countess. Well, the wife of a marquis is a marchioness, so the mother had this wonderful title of the dowager marchioness of Tweedale. I love it. Somebody remarked, almost worth losing a husband for to get a title like that. <laughs> but they were quite lovely. And I just had a wonderful time with them. All of these families, I could have stayed longer with all of them. 
And of course there he is with his tiger that he had shot, let me know. Inja, Laraj. Well, with him I toured the Scott country. The, 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 this is the area south. Famous for having been uh, the home of Sir Walter Scott, the great novelist who wrote all those Waverley novels and Kenilworth and Lord of the Isles and so forth. And this spot, I'm told, was uh, his favorite spot. And whenever he'd be out riding, he would stop his horse and just enjoy this view. So it's become known as Scott's View. And it really is quite beautiful. Scott's View. That's something he never saw. <laughs> something he never saw. Uh, how do you like that? I still have that tan buried away somewhere. <laughs> well, with um, uh, Colonel Stewart, we toured the famous ruined abbeys. You know, there were monasteries and abbeys, and with all these border wars, uh, they got destroyed. So you have these picturesque ruins. One of them is Melrose, no, 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 Dryborough. The first one is Dryborough. Uh, quite a shrine because it was here in this portion of the ruin that Sir Walter Scott is buried and of course we visited his grave and there it is, Sir Walter Scott. Dryborough, D-R-Y-B-U-R-G-H -Y -Y I believe. Well we drove around in this very dramatic countryside and um, oh dear another one sorry. I uh, went to Melrose, Melrose Abbey, which again was a great monastery, I think it was Cistercian. And it was uh, again in the wars and these would be looted and broken down, but they survive as great dramatic ruins. Melrose Abbey, probably the most famous and most visited of these several ruined abbeys in this area. I like this one, I got a silhouette almost shadowed. Well, of course, we had to go to Abbotsford. Abbotsford was Sir Walter Scott's home, and he built this in great uh, country style. Made it a museum in his lifetime of Scottish history, filled with all sorts of memorabilia, as you can see here. And of course some guns and swords and all the rest of it that you had to fill the house with. This was his library room. You look at all those ancient books and piles of things. And his desk where he wrote much of his books. One of Scotland's most famous and most revered figures, Sir Walter Scott. one of the charm, uh, one of the uh, sitting rooms of the house. And this is the dining room. And he, uh, I'm told that when he was dying, uh, Sir Walter Scott asked to be moved to the dining room because he loved the view. So you might say that's Scott's last view, overlooking the grounds of his beloved estate. It's really quite beautiful. Well-kept grounds. And this is the Tweed, uh, Tweed River here. Abbotsford, named because at one time there was a monastery and the abbots crossed the river. So Abbotsford, I'm told, is the origin of the name. I had to do that. But Abbotsford, is, is, it, was, it was a very special highlight. Well, the last of the ruined monasteries was Jedborough, which was um, again sacked and destroyed during the many border wars. The amount of fighting that took place between the British, the English, and the Scots is unbelievable. I remember when I went to, after this, this part, we went to England, we went to Durham with this incredibly beautiful cathedral, and it looks like a fortress, and it was described as being half house of God and half castle against the Scots. But this is Jedborough. Look at that. Dramatic. Roof gone, but the walls all standing. I was impressed with this. Well, we then uh, went on down towards the English 
uh, towards the border. And here was the border where Scotland and England joined. And of course, I had to have my picture taken there with one foot in England and one foot in Scotland, right on the border. How's that? Well, uh, Colonel Stewart, we drove on into England and into Northumberland, which is the largest county. And um, uh, one of the things I wanted to see there was the Roman wall of Hadrian. And um, we spent quite a bit of time, and of course, having a, a military officer with me who understood about it was quite delightful. But this is where we finished that, and then, of course, he arranged to meet the next family, so I then went with my first family in England from here. But this is some of this very wild and open country in Northumberland. End of the, that's the end of the show. Um, I hope you I hope you haven't fallen asleep. I've kept you awake. How long did it take you to take this journey? Pardon? How long did it take you to take this journey? I was there about a month. Because I was in England besides Scotland. So. Lucas was glad to get rid of me for a few weeks. <laughs> did you bring the large order plate from uh, one of those big shipyards in Scotland? Did you have instructions to bring them along? No, 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 no. No, they had enough of their own over there, really. But, you know, a very highlight of this trip was being able to stay with, with families, which I did through the whole, through the whole thing. Um, it's sort of an interesting story how it came about. I knew none of these people, of course. Uh, when I was planning this trip, I was wondering how I was going to get about in Britain. And I could have taken a bus tour or something. Uh, well, I had a friend in New York who I had met previously who worked for the British Travel uh, Information Office in New York. And uh, I had gotten acquainted with her through getting information for previous trip. So I went to talk to her. I said, how am I going to do this? Well, she said you could drive. Well, I wasn't going to drive. You know, they drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I figured I'd forget and I would be history and scrap. But she told me this. She said, I think I just have the perfect thing for you. There was a chap in London who had a country house. And he often entertained. And he had the idea that there must be loads of people in Britain who had homes, maybe retired, and would like to have visitors. So he started to run advertisements in magazines like Country Life and Tatler and so forth. Had a large response. Found there were a lot of people who were interested in doing this. So he developed this uh, program. He called it the Oak Leaf Enterprises. Everything handled from his office in London. You told him where you wanted to go, and he would see if he had a family or a house who, who was available. It was sort of like a bed and breakfast thing. And you would go to their house, have dinner, stay over, and have breakfast. I said, well, yeah, how am I going to find him? She said, well, wait, wait, wait. She said, he's got a refinement. A lot of these people are willing to do touring in their immediate area. So I said, oh, this is perfect. So that's what we did. So we arranged it. And uh, oh, there was a lot of correspondence back and forth between me and this chap in London. And so finally, um, we worked out an itinerary. And then I took it to June, this friend in the British travel. Oh, no, you can't do this. That's too far. And we finally got it all worked out. So I stayed with four families in Scotland and five families in England. And it was kind of fun because, um, you know, the more I traveled, the more they knew about me. Because family number one would have to meet family number two to transfer me and my baggage and so forth. By the time I got down to Lower England with Admiral Cuthbert, he says, oh, we got a full file on you, a full dossier. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble. And I remember the first family in England, uh, in, um, in Yorkshire, uh, the hostess one night said, oh, we're going to have grouse tonight. So when it came dinner time, I said, where's the grouse? She said, well, I saw the expression on your face. After several uh, houses in Scotland, you probably had enough of grouse, so she had something else. But it was beautiful because they were all lovely, and there wasn't any of the families that I wouldn't have been happy to spend more time with. So that's what it was. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it, and thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.